Okay, so here with uh, Bill Nye, our guest of science. Um, now, Bill, how did you become uh, a skeptic? Not just like, hey, I'm a scientific skeptical guy, but I am a card-carrying token, you know, skeptic. Uh, I met a guy in Seattle. Uh, tell you when I when I, I lived there for many years. A guy named Phil Haldeman uh, became a friend of mine, and he was a member of the Northwest Skeptics. And uh, he got me started on the skeptical point of view, and since then I think it's just great. It's very much consistent with science. But before that, I had Carl Sagan for astronomy. So for astronomy class, my paper was about Curlian photography. If anybody remembers this, this is auras. You have an aura that would be photographable. Now, you, you young guys, you may not remember this, but there were Polaroids. Polaroid film, which you can manipulate with your fingers and put an aura. You can squeeze the three colors, or maybe four colors of emulsion so that you, you create an aura behind people. And this is very much akin visually to uh, the aura you get, it's called a glory, a naturally occurring thing that happens when there's uh, fog, water droplets, or even ice crystals in the air the uh, refraction, reflection of light will create a rainbow around the observer, yeah. around your eyes, or if you hold a camera up like this, you can get a rainbow around the camera. And so uh, I got into that real early on in college. I got this, I did, I did the investigation from scratch, not knowing maybe there is something to it, because there is a corona discharge when you have a spark that'll affect photographic film really well. You get a quite a around uh, quite a jolt around an object. So long answer. Go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, but uh, since then you uh, have been uh, involved. Uh, is this, by the way, you're you're going to be a Tam Nine? Yes, Tam is this, Nine. Is this your first Tam? My first Tam. Oh, the really? Amazing meeting. Yeah. And I've been. You know, I've met these guys, and I've spent time with James Randi at the National Science Teachers Association in the past, and Michael Shermer has become a friend of mine. The Skeptics uh, magazine and so on. And I've met Penn and Teller a few times. They are um, represented by the same guy who represents me as a publicist. <laughs> so oh. I've spent time with these people, but this is my first official wow. The Amazing Meeting. Why is that? What, uh, what took you so long to, to come out and say hi? Well, I, uh, there's other things going on. I'm oh, sorry. okay. I mean, You're a busy man. I know. Well, I, mean, I know. Yeah, and I do fight the good fight, and I was humanist of the year last year. Nice. Which is not strictly skeptical, <laughs> but it's, it's related. It seems, don't you, spiritually, pun intended, related. Nice, nice. Uh, now, you, uh, you obviously did Bill Nye, the science guy. That's yes. where a lot of people know you. Now, my question about that is, because uh, that, that show was produced, you know, a little while ago. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> What kind of what kind of editing system do they use to make that? Because I watch it nowadays, and that is still to this day one of the busiest, fast-paced, you know, fast-cutting shows. This is a technical question, everybody, but it was done uh, with the state of the art at that time. The brand name was Avid, ah. which was related to Apple Computer Macintosh, and we had oh man, we had 12 one gigabyte drives. Ooh. And it was very labor intensive, very time consuming, but I'll say the reason it worked is because the guy, the people who did it were so dedicated. The men and women who worked on it just really wanted to do a good job. And that's the thing that the charm of television and movies for me to this day is it's still handmade. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's electronics. Yes, it's technology out the yin yang. Yes. We had to install an air conditioning system just for these hard drives in those days. Uh, but you're doing it by hand. You're looking at it. You're deciding if it looks right. You're listening to it. This is one story. This is not apocryphal. This is a true story. Somebody falls down. And my recollection, uh, this, this part is I'm not clear on, but I think it was the friction show. The guy falls down. We needed the sound effect of him falling down. Jim uh, Wilson, this sound editor at the time, just wasn't happy with the sounds he was creating. So he threw himself down the stairway of the uh, <laughs> Bad Animals, the name of this audio company, just to get it just right. Nice. And this is not the point, but it's representative of the, everybody was just trying to make a good show. Yeah. So uh, 
One of the most popular shows of the Science Guy series was the, the uh, paranormal pseudoscience show, where we showed you how it's generally done, very James Randi style stuff. This is to say he gives you a million dollars if you can produce a paranormal effect that he can't reproduce. No one's ever collected the million. So we showed you, um, you make an extraordinary claim and you evaluate it. The world is round. That seems incredible. If you live near the ocean or a lake, it looks flat. But no, it turns out you can actually show it's round. Uh, then, uh, I have astrological powers. I can predict your future based on the day you were born. You can show that that is absolutely not reasonable. Yeah. It's not right. Now, uh, I saw your later series, uh, The Eyes of Nye. Eyes of Nye. Eyes of Nye. I was wondering, um, is there any uh, chance of more episodes or more... Uh... Well, I would love that. But The Eyes of Nye uh, was made at a public broadcasting station that ran into all kinds of trouble. Uh. The head guy was forced to resign, and there was all these pro uh, projects he had started that never got finished, and the eyes of Nye barely squeaked through, so it was one of the last things we did there. And Disney bought the rights to it, and uh, they show it in classrooms with the sort of compare this to that style, yeah. which is good, but we took on, as you may remember, some cool stuff, stuff that didn't have a right or wrong answer. Yeah. Nuclear waste, genetically modified foods, um, the... Um, a show about sex. Why do why do organisms have sex? Diversity. It's a heck of a question. You know, why don't you just split yourself in half like any good bacterium? Yeah. Why do you bother with all this other? Here's a tree. It goes to all kinds of trouble to make pollen and eggs and fruiting bodies. It's crazy. Why bother with all that when you could just? And this answer seems to be diseases, germs, and parasites. That's what gets you. Nice. The lions and tigers and bears, they're troublesome. You know, if you're Dorothy, lions and tigers, but that's not really the problem. The problem is germs, parasites. Now, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple issues uh, like genetically modified foods. You guys took kind of a, a very, I, I guess, even much more of a skeptical stance than a lot of skeptics I know do, because a lot of skeptics I know are huge defenders of GMO. Well, here's the thing. Here's, what, here's the conclusion that I reached from the show. You guys can evaluate. You can know the organism itself very well. In the modern world, you can analyze its DNA, its gene sequence, very well. What you, is really difficult to get for sure is what happens to the ecosystem. This is to say, when you put this genetically modified organism in a cornfield or um, a fish uh, farm, it's hard to say what's going to happen to all the surrounding organisms. Unintended consequences are the big concern. Yeah. So the th we took three examples, which are just cool. Uh, the um, modifying the corn so that the the corn borer, which is an invasive species, uh, in the last couple of centuries, if it if it starts to eat the uh, modified corn, it explodes. It doesn't know it's had enough to eat, which kills it. Which is good if you're a guy that depends on corn. Uh, then we had. Um, the uh, genes from Arctic fish put in tomatoes. Oh yeah, I remember that. And the tomatoes are not as susceptible to freezing. It's good, but there's something intuitive that's not, something about putting fish in tomatoes, there's something weird about that. And then the other one uh, was the, uh, this spot virus that gets on papaya. So they took a gene from the virus put it in the papaya's gene sequence, and then it's not susceptible to the virus anymore. And you don't have to know anything about papaya. This one looks bad. This one looks great. I mean, you yeah. could just, okay. So the, the thing with the corn borer is somehow it got affected. It was affect, it had the potential to affect the monarch butterfly population, having to do with milkweed that grows near the corn. And, and it's the kind of thing you just, milkweed, Monarch butterflies, I was trying to get rid of this beetle. Yeah, and so uh, then we also spoke to the, the wheat breeder from Washington State. Now, Washington State, turns out, has an enormous wheat crop. Yeah. It's this whole thing from the Cascade Mountains all the way to Idaho is wheat. And he says, hey man, this is all you gotta do. You do it the good old fashioned way. You shake the pollen from one onto the eggs, the ova of another, just like George Washington did. And you get good wheat. 
and you inherently do not, you're not going to get in trouble with the ecosystem because it will shake out. Uh, this wheat is almost naturally occurring. We just can nudge it along. There's no fish genes in the wheat genes, for example. And uh, you, I saw you guys also tackled the, uh, the, the go-to um, people, but aren't people starving in the world? Aren't people, you know, fed by genetically modified food oh, everywhere? Yeah. Well, I mean, th that's great. Uh, it just turns out the, uh, the claims associated, you're talking about golden rice, right? Yeah. The claims associated with golden rice and vitamin A and childhood blindness are reasonable, but not, uh, not clear that you save the world with it. The price of developing it was quite high, uh. and it's not clear that the extra vitamin A did all that it was claimed it could. Yeah. Uh, and once again, you don't know what's going to happen to the ecosystem. You start growing that rice. It's probably better, uh, well, I don't want to get in trouble. It may be better to just have better agricultural practices in general rather than claiming that this right rice was a panacea for childhood blindness. Mm -hmm.